perhaps I could just start by introducing ourselves. Um, because as you are aware, this is going to be screened and yes. I hope you're happy with that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm Julia Cumberledge and um, I was invited by the previous Secretary of State, Jeremy Hunt, uh, to chair this review um, into three different areas. Um, first of all, uh, of course, um, we're looking at um, uh, HPT's uh, hormone pregnancy tests. We're looking at uh, sodium valparate and other medications involved with that and then with surgical mesh and they are very different areas and perhaps <coughs> later on um, you would agree that uh, we could start with some general questions and then we could have um, the HPTs, the hormone pregnancy tests and then we'll have a break and um, then we'll have um, sodium valparate and then mesh and then wrap up questions. Does that sound yes, all yes, right of course. I mean, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, where we're touching on clinical matters, uh, you will be better informed if uh, yes, the chief medical course. officer is with us rather than That's William and I remembering what she has said to us on the subject. So, uh, so, so, we, so we may at times say that question yes. will be uh, be better addressed by, uh, Fair uh, by Sally. So I'm not sure if you've met Valerie Brass, who is our yeah. secretary, and she's yeah. on my far right, and Simon Whale, who's yeah. the third member of this yes. panel, with Sir Cyril Chantler, who's the deputy to the review team, and um, Sonia McLeod, Dr. McLeod, who is yep. our senior researcher. Yep. So that's us. Yep. Um, and <clears throat> so perhaps um, if I could uh, just start, I, you, you are very aware of the activities that we've been carrying out, going around the country, yes. talking to a lot of patients, uh, hearing their stories, and also um, we've been filming oral evidence, and um, that is on our website for those people uh, who want to have a look at it and see what we're doing. One of the things that's come across very strongly to us is that um, <clears throat> there has been a bit of a breakdown of trust between patients, doctors, surgeons, some of the organisations and so on. And so we've been very, very careful to be as open, honest, transparent as we possibly can be so that people know what we're saying. Nothing is secret. Yeah. We're just um, uh, really, as I say, being a, uh, as transparent as we possibly can. So for the sake of the... Um, the screening that we're doing today, it would be very helpful. Um, but if perhaps you could just say who you are, so that it's on there and people know uh, who, who they're listening to. Uh, of course, I'm uh, I'm Chris Wormold. I'm the permanent secretary of the uh, uh, Department of Health and uh, uh, Social Care, uh, which I have been for almost exactly three years. May May 2016, I. Uh, uh, I started uh, in this uh, role, and uh, and just for complete completeness and to state uh, the obvious, uh, we were in a slightly different position than many of the witnesses that you talked to, because it was, of course, our Secretary of State, via us, and particularly what via William, who will introduce himself in a moment, uh, who uh, uh, sought to establish uh, the. Uh, 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 committee the panel in the first place uh, to address exactly the issues you have just uh, uh, just described. So to that extent we are of course conflicted um, but to the extent that um, uh, you know our purpose here um, uh, is simply to uh, uh, assist the panel in any way we can uh, on the facts uh, of uh, 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 your uh, deliberations. We come with a uh, uh, no agenda other than uh, to seek to assist the panel that we uh, set up in its search for the truth. And as I say, by almost by definition, that the Secretary of State wished to um, uh, uh, establish an independent panel to look at this is a, um, uh, a statement that there was truth to be found that was not found previously, if you see what I mean. So in terms of what you have said you have been doing, that is of course uh, uh, exactly what we expected. Yes, can colleague. I say, of course, yeah. we value our independence. Uh, yes, well, and, um, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that is the whole point. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes. Yes, thank so, you. I'm William Vine, I'm the Director of Acute Care and Quality at the Department of Health and Social Care. I've been in this post for just over three years, and I've worked in the department since 1998, and before that I worked in the NHS. And obviously, as Chris has said, uh, we are the part of the department that uh, commissioned the inquiry for yourself, as you know, Julia. And obviously the role I'm in here today is along with Chris to give answers to questions and uh, policy positions and all of those other things. 
and clearly just for the purposes of the audience it's then for you to return the report at a future stage and for us to take it forward from there so I am playing a slightly different role today from the sponsorship role from when we set up the inquiry and as you know for the record the person in my team who is the day-to-day -day contact with the inquiry is Jason Yanaku who is one of my deputy directors. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed. So, if perhaps I could just start by um, some general questions, really. Um, you will be very much aware, because uh, <coughs> if you've had a chance at all to look at the website and seen some of the, um, the interviews that we've had with patients, and certainly we've heard a huge amount from them, um, they have campaigned and they have lobbied in Parliament in order to bring this thing to a head, to get the review established and um, clearly they've been talking to ministers and indeed the Secretary of State. So uh, my question to you really is, um, why has it taken so long for these issues uh, to be taken so seriously and for the review to be set up? Um, right, I'll, 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 I'll start on that question and then I'll uh, ask William to, uh, 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 to add. Um, I mean, as I was suggesting before, um, uh, to, uh, uh, the very uh, the very existence of a panel um, uh, is a uh, statement uh, that things were uh, not in the position that we wanted them to be. Um, uh, it is obviously. Um, I was about to say, um, I'm not quite sure what the right word is. Um, it is not an unusual step to set up a panel. Um, indeed, we currently have different types of inquiry. I think there are four currently running uh, in health. So it, so it is a established part of the health landscape. Um, but it doesn't happen when, or as a statement of the obvious, when the standard systems for ensuring um, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the right response uh, to patients and safety have done their job. Well, you know, so we, it's almost a statement. Of, it's almost a circular statement, isn't it? You only establish an independent inquiry when you believe that new light is uh, to be uh, thrown on a uh, uh, on a subject. Uh, and therefore, it is always a question: Why was this not spotted before, and why is a panel needed? As it were. Uh, so, to that extent, it's slightly uh, uh, unanswerable. On the specifics, however, uh, of uh, this. Uh, I think in all three cases, but William will yeah. give uh, further detail, um, there was action being taken. Um, and from our reading of the evidence, and I, sh and I should say whenever we say our reading of the evidence, um, uh, we set up the panel because we wanted somebody else's reading of the evidence, so it is not um, uh, uh, to that extent the department doesn't have a view other than we want the panel to do its uh, uh, work properly, but from our reading of the evidence, uh, there were actions in the system, um, sometimes disputed, uh, but actions in the system um, on all three of these issues, and therefore the question um, is um, more uh, not uh, why was action not taken because it was, but was that action sufficient, and crucially, um, as you have already pointed to. Uh, in your question, uh, did it take sufficient account of the voices of patients? Mm. Well, well, could you, so could you just tell us then what sort of actions that you, uh, well, William, do you want to or yeah. ask William yeah. perhaps? Well, in terms of actually, we'll do this at two levels. Okay. If, you, if you want to do it on the individual cases, and then I will say something about patient safety overall is probably the most helpful. So, I mean, obviously, on MESH, we took a range of action um, after it first came to light in. 2012, realistically, through Bruce Keogh, to try and address some of the issues that were being raised in terms of there was a MESH working group, there was an interim report in 2015, there was a final report two years later that looked at clinical quality, improved data, improved patient information in terms of leaflets. And then um, there has since then, and since, in a sense, your involvement, further data has been published, uh, a nice guideline pulling together all the, all the various guidelines on different kinds of measures being published, and a number of decision aids for aiding and abetting, you know, public, public uh, individual debate with clinicians on these issues. So we have taken action, but as Chris says, clearly there was a, there was a head of concern amongst patients that out with all of those activities, 
probably wasn't being sufficiently recognised. There were various systems in place to capture it, which I won't go through now, mm -hmm. but at the same time they needed to be a more effective way of, of listening to that side of the equation, if you like. So mm -hmm. there is clearly the evidence, there is the advice, there are the processes, but then there are the patient voices as well. And uh, obviously the Secretary of State felt at the end of 2017 that notwithstanding the other things that had been done, there needed to be a way of uh, hearing those in a much more systematic way than we had mm -hmm. done before, which is why um, we called the inquiry. Similarly with Valparate, I mean, as you know, there have been sort of um, gr growing warnings since it was a popular anti-epileptic in the 70s and 80s um, about doing further work. There was a review led by the MHRA in 2014, um, but following that, there was still concern that the advice that they'd done to, I mean, effectively start to restrict the use of Valparate had not gone far enough. And so obviously last year, there was um, a further more rigorous review that led to the Pregnancy Prevention Programme that says, beyond knowing the risk and there being a clear and obvious clinical indication to to provide that, I'm not the scientist, um, we should try and wind down the use of that uh, particular intervention. Um, there was also questions at that time about the MHRA um, looking at the question of packaging and leaflets and making sure that that was sufficiently thorough. So I think in both of those cases, um, there has been progress made, um, but again, the question of how adept the various systems we have were at taking on board the patient voice at an appropriate time, not retrospectively, was clearly the issue that motivated the previous Secretary of State to announce this inquiry. So I think, I suppose in summary I'd say there's been progress but there is clearly the issue outstanding about how you bring the patient voice into those other activities uh, at the same time and not necessarily retrospectively or after having to have a Yes. And then I mean, part of um, the review, of course, is going to be looking forward yes. to yes. see how we can do exactly. things better in the past. But yeah. just looking at, back, uh, at the past, I mean, with MESH, the uh, campaign groups have been going for over 10 years. And um, I just wonder how we can pick up some of those um, issues much earlier and listen to what our patients are telling us, because clearly they weren't picked up uh, over all that period. And if you look at uh, Valparate, um, Valparate was known to be um, tetragenic, uh, and it was, um, that was when it was licensed in 73, but it's actually taken uh, till 2015 um, for um, real action to be taken by the EMA. Now that's 40 years. 40 years is a long time when babies are being harmed and um, that uh, parents are having to look after very disabled children. And um, again, if you look at um, uh, certainly um, Primados, um, the HPTs, um, they were put on the market a long, long time ago. Uh, and it took from 78 to 14 for a government review of the evidence. And that was by the MHRA. So cer certainly everything has taken far too long and we would welcome any thoughts that you have about how things like this could be speeded up um, and that really in the future these sort of tragedies won't happen. Yeah, um, well should I say something about patient safety uh, overall uh, on uh, uh, this and um, um, I should uh, again state the obvious um, I will describe uh, what I have observed since 2016 and then what I have been told um, about the previous periods, most of which are the ones uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you describe. Um, now, at the top level, um, again to state the obvious, in something as complex um, as a uh, uh, as a health system, uh, making a billion prescriptions a year and, 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 you know all the uh, uh, numbers, um, there will be mistakes and there will be accidents. Um, uh, but, um, and so our starting point um, is 
we need a set of functions that minimize the chances of those happening and then exactly as you say respond quickly when they uh, uh, do so um, and it is a battle never won um, new, new, new patient safety uh, issues uh, come up uh, all the time um, partly because of course we invent new treatments which have new side effects and new responsibilities on uh, clinicians uh, uh, to deal uh, with um, I think it is fair to say um, that um, it is reasonably uh, widely acknowledged that, um, uh, that Jeremy Hunt uh, brought a focus uh, to patient safety uh, in terms of national policy uh, in a way that was, um, uh, again, I, uh, it's slightly like difficult to find the right word because it is not, uh, and, and I do not want to give the implication that previous ministers did not take patient safety seriously, because I suspect that you would know that, um, uh, that every minister uh, who uh, serves in uh, uh, health takes these issues seriously. But I think it is reasonably widely acknowledged that, uh, that Jeremy brought a new policy focus uh, to patient safety, particularly post um, uh, uh, mid uh, uh, the mid Staffordshire. Uh, question which brought these to light very quickly and has some of the same characteristics of who was uh, who was listened to and when were they listened to and how did the system uh, then respond um, and certainly what we have seen uh, over the um, uh, 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 the last seven years uh, has been a lot actually um, of new policy and new initiatives around uh, uh, patient safety, um, which uh, has done various things. Um, uh, uh, a lot of those initiatives have done uh, 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 big things in their own so Chris, right. I, I yep. think we absolutely agree with you. It yep. is a very complex area. Oh, yeah. no. and, and one of the very yep. difficulties that yep. we've had, and I'm yep. sure that you do in yep. the department, is actually finding some of the facts out. Yep. For instance, we just don't know how many women uh, took hormone pregnancy tests. We don't know how many people yep. are affected by fetal valparate yes. syndrome. And we don't yep. know how many women have had MESH. Yep. Now, the system really, I think you would agree, needs to be uh, quicker and more oh, yeah. thorough. And no, we so really do um, need the facts. Yeah. And for us in the review, yeah. that makes it very difficult oh, yeah. when we're trying to think of the yes. future because we don't know how many people have been involved. No, I think that's, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And this is what I was... Uh, uh, this is what I was coming uh, on to. Uh, now, clearly, um, at, uh, uh, we can't reinvent the past so on some of those things. If the facts don't exist, they don't exist. Um, and that is an uh, issue that we all have to uh, uh, deal with. Well, A, in terms of making the best of what we do have for right now, and B, ensuring that we have the right systems uh, uh, going, uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say about our initiatives and focus on uh, patient safety, and I know this has come up in uh, uh, in other hearings, um, is it has created um, uh, uh, a lot of action, a lot of focus, but actually a very complicated landscape, which I think you were pointed uh, to before. And we are very conscious uh, in the uh, 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 in the department um, that, uh, as I say, the work the work on this area is never done. Um, uh, so there will not be a day when we say now we have the right system for patient safety and it's all uh, fine and we have been doing it uh, as an uh, evolutionary thing uh, so uh, the most recent uh, thing the appointment of um, uh, one of them uh, the last things Jeremy Hunt did actually uh, the appointment of a joint uh, national uh, patient safety director uh, across uh, who is both an employee of NHSE, NHSI and a deputy chief medical officer in the department uh, was a uh, uh, the, the intention and I'll say we're only a year into it so we will see if it works the intention was to create much more of a single point of focus for patient uh, safety work which while recognizing that we do actually want lots of bodies that look at patient safety from different angles it has to come together somewhere and as I think you know uh, his intention is to produce a national patient safety strategy uh, in the summer which yep. he's uh, uh, working on uh, at the moment um, where we do need to address exactly the questions you are raising mm -hmm. um, so um, where we need 
uh, to uh, improve our data systems that needs to be uh, in the strategy going forward uh, where we need to improve uh, the training and development of clinicians have some of the conversations you've been talking about that needs to be in the strategy so we do need to look across this thing and we are conscious um, and, um, uh, and what we would expect is that, uh, that the recommendations you will eventually make become part of that uh, mm. strategy but there is a lot more to do in these areas uh, to ensure that the um, uh, the problems of the past you are pointing to um, are not also the point uh, the, uh, uh, the problems of the uh, future yep. so I don't think there is anything between us and you on that sort of diagnosis of the, yes. the overall well, problem I think what we would say is there has been a sort of long evolution of this over the last six years, which is not necessarily to say we've got it right. No, yeah. if we've got it wrong, can I, can I come in at this point, yes. uh, William, yeah. excuse me, because I think uh, the answer you'll give me will be better informed if I actually have the chance to answer this question. Uh, we are aware of a large number of organisations that uh, either directly or indirectly report into the Department of yeah. Health, all of which have interests in the care of patients and the safety of yep. the National Health Service. Yep. And uh, I mean, there are, I don't know how many people who have regulatory uh, responsibility in HS, but we think there are over a hundred of them. Uh, I mean, there are enormous numbers. But, yep. but you know, when you look at the landscape of the NHS Improvement, NICE, NHS Digital Health yep. Education England, NHS yep. Resolution, NHS Business Authority, Blood and Transport, and, uh, Blood and Transplant uh, Organisations. And we can see a hierarchy yep. where they, they report in. And, uh, but what I can't see is the cross connection. So yep. as well as the risk of vertical disconnection in the yep. terms, yep. you have the risk of horizontal disconnection. And yep. how much is that a policy problem? And if, and if it is, what well, do you think should be done? I'll say, to, um, I'll to say two things. It? I'll say two things, and then I think. I mean, uh, uh, the issue you point to is a real one. You will be unsurprised uh, to uh, hear me uh, uh, say, and it of course arises. Um, uh, across a range of policies, not just uh, uh, safety, and we have of course been doing uh, things across the board uh, to uh, uh, try and bring greater coordination uh, to those things, particularly the current uh, uh, proposals work um, uh, uh, in implementation uh, to bring together the work of NHSE and NHSI into a single thing and to then integrate uh, uh, particularly health education England much more into the same thing, which is a recognition not, not particularly of the safety issue concern, but the general issue, because I say it applies across uh, policy. And uh, what I've just mentioned, the um, uh, having a national director of um, uh, patient safety who works across organisations and a single strategy um, is also a reflection uh, of exactly uh, what you Do you think uh, patients are now, properly represented within those uh, structures? I think, I think that's your solution. I think that's, a good, I, I think that's a good question and um, uh, it uh, um, uh, uh, again uh, needs to be reflected in a uh, proper national uh, patient safety uh, strategy. Um, and you will be unsurprised. The only thing I would add before William comes in is of course that uh, what you just described is quite a recent structure it is a since 2012 uh, structure uh, brought in by the 2012 act which as a deliberate act of policy as you all know uh, took the view that you should disaggregate uh, the health system and not have single pinnacles of power that was the philosophy uh, of the legislation now the Mind you, some of uh, yep. what we're yep. dealing with goes back. Well, this that. is exactly what I, I was going I to say. You may not have made it any better. Well, this is exactly what I was going to say. So, if you're looking for causes of the uh, issues that uh, the, uh, the Baroness was uh, describing, yeah. uh, it's difficult to, as it were, uh, apportion them to a system that has only existed since really 2013, where, as you say, many of the causes and issues go much further back into history at a time when the NHS wasn't, as you know, much better than I, much more hierarchical and strategic health authorities, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and brought into one place. So, while, uh, so, sorry, this is a slightly complicated answer, I completely recognise and agree with the issues you raise about the structure, and as I say, this is one of the things we want to deal with, but just as a piece of causation, it cannot be the root cause of some of the issues you have been describing because it hasn't existed long enough 
if you see what I mean. Does, the, the, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Question? It's very helpful. Yeah. So on the, I mean, on the post-2012 part of your question, um, Sir Cyril, I mean, obviously one of the things that the new uh, patient safety strategy is looking at is to formalise the involvement of patients, and indeed it was one of the issues, uh, one of the criteria that is in um, Adam's job description. So we are trying to put that at centre stage. I mean, obviously the healthcare safety investigation branch was established partly to do investigations based on impacts on people and impacts on services both. And one of the reasons why we established that branch, which effectively reports into NHS improvement, was because we'd had a run of investigations and inquiries, more compared with staffs and things that I worked on, and we were trying to put a piece of infrastructure in place, going back to your previous question, uh, Julia, uh, about actually trying to have more real-time investigations. Um, similarly, MHRA has now done some things to appoint a patient engagement lead and other things like that. So I think, as Chris said, there are some things that we've done since 2012 to try and simplify the infrastructure that you described, uh, Sir Cyril. There are things that we are doing to try and run alongside the experience of patients in the structures that we have. And obviously, some of the things pre-existed 2012 when we weren't as aware of those issues. Mm. One of my roles in the department is to oversee various investigations and inquiries, as, as Chris said, and I was at the Gospel panel on Tuesday, and my function there for the department, where people, for a very historic inquiry, not, not to do with um, uh, devices, but to do with other aspects of care, were saying that what you, what you needed at the time was an explanation in real time that allowed you either to put your mind at rest or to be able to move on with some further activity. Now the system of medical examiners, which I know was announced some years ago, but the National Medical Examiner was announced last month, Alan Fletcher, is trying to, will get to a position where once all the medical examiners are appointed for non-coronial deaths, it is possible to have a small eye investigation and an explanation. Can I interrupt you because the um, we time. don't have a huge amount of time. I want to return to yeah. the patient voice we have time in a few yes. minutes. But there seems to be a tendency, <coughs> you're as familiar as anybody, in the line of things that have gone wrong. I mean, it's a whole litany. You mentioned gospel, you mentioned ours, the blood inquiry that's going on at the moment. And and the answer has been to, to say, well, we'd better put in something else to deal with. And HSIB is very welcome, and, and it, but it, uh, it, I think it's an excellent initiative. But if they value and rightly their independence. Yep. The medical examiners are by their nature independent. Mm -hmm. That's an essential part of it. So the, the, the underlying question which I asked to Chris is how do you make sure that they link together so yep. that if you take something you and I are familiar with the yep. maternity, how do you make sure the investigation links to the support for families and links then to the learning, because it's all about the cross-links, not about the vertical yeah. links. Yes, yeah. I think there were two things, and again, uh, William uh, will add, well, th sorry, three things. Uh, the first, uh, and just to say it on record, uh, the answer to your question is with intense difficulty. You know, when you are dealing with an organisation of 1.4 million people, and, yes. um, uh, and uh, all those treatments and all those different specialisms and all those different health settings, um, and exactly as you say, um, and rightly in my view, an awful lot of independence in the system. You, uh, you would add to your list the General Medical Council, the division we have mm -hmm. always had between mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the regulation of individual doctors being entirely separate from the state, I think rightly, mm -hmm. and the regulation of institutions being largely within the state, be it via NHSI mm -hmm. or CQC or whatever, which is a historic division not changed by 2012. I think most people think that is right, but creates exactly the uh, environment that you do. So I don't personally, and um, um, so I don't think that's quite how it sounds. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not inviting the panel to disagree with me, but obviously it's one of the things we want from you, as well, as you want my personal view. Um, I do think creating things which are not the executive manager of the system, but whose job it is to scan the whole horizon um, in the way that we want the National Patient Safety Director to do is very important. 
Um, I don't actually think a giant hierarchy that all reports to one person who, who don't have those measures of uh, independence. I, I, I do think uh, that. And then the second thing, I think, and we may come on to this, um, I do think um, a, uh, a lot of the issues we have seen are locked in how do we train clinicians. So I'm sure this is a point that Sally will make when she has made it to me uh, uh, before, is we have, we have already seen a complete revolution in how we train clinicians and people who work in the health system about how they relate uh, to patients and duties of candor and all those sorts of things. But an awful lot of the issues we're discussing uh, uh, come down to um, what was the quality of the original conversation and the informed consent between a clinician you have never met and a patient you have never met. You are never going to have a national system that guarantees that success. What will guarantee it is the professionalism of those clinicians based on how they're trained and how they're developed. I know I don't need to tell you this, but look, so one of our questions going forward, we've made a lot of changes in that area. Um, what, what further changes uh, do we need in the light of the types of incident that you're uh, uh, that we're, you're referring to, and I don't know if you share this view. So, well, I do think that um, certainly from what I have been told, um, the world has moved on considerably in that area in clinical education and the, uh, those things, but there is still further to go. Is that a yeah, I, I, fair summary? I yes, so. we might want to go in with Sally yes. uh, when she comes in about the um, <coughs> the individual. Um, rapport, the trust, the whatever between the clinician and the patient. I think what we're talking about here is something much wider. Yep. We're talking about where you really have a campaign running yes. with people who have been seriously injured and nobody has really listened to them. And we're trying to sort of think how we can ensure that the patient voice really is heard yep. and heard at an early stage yes. because at the moment we know people are still being injured yes. and that is really unacceptable in, yep. an, in the NHS. But I am going to pass on Yes, yeah, so I mean, can I, can I pick up on exactly that point? Mm. So I mean, we've talked a lot about structure, but there's more to this than just structures. Yes. So, so the, yep. a lot of what people have told us, the many, many hundreds of people we've met, is that the system gives the impression of wanting to defend itself or even deny that there's a problem when patients present concerns about the medication or device that, that, that's been used in their procedures. Yeah. So it's starting right. point, the starting point, the sort of cultural yeah. or attitudinal starting point, as they would say, is one of defensiveness or denial. Would you agree with that? Um, well, um, yeah. The, the, the just welcome, the, Sally. Yes. Thank you yes. very much indeed for coming. And yeah. if you could just tell the camera who you are. Right. Um, yes. So, I'm Sally Davis. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for England and the most senior uh, medical advisor to the UK government. As Chief Medical Officer, I am an independent advisor, medical, uh, particularly focusing on public health and emergencies. Thank you. Yes, that's lovely. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, back, uh, back, back, watching back to your question. <laughs> at, yes. um, and um, um, I'll, I'll answer your question uh, strictly. Um, does what you describe happen in the NHS and has it historically happened? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, quite clearly, and we have a number of um, reports and reviews that have made that point about uh, uh, institutional uh, reaction, and um, uh, and quite clearly, when that does happen, it is wrong. Um, uh, but, uh, clearly, uh, the uh, the first thought of anyone uh, who works in a health system has to be uh, the um, uh, the benefit of the patient, uh, not the reputation of the institution or. Uh, uh, or individual reputations or whatever. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and uh, as I say, there are a number of uh, incidents on which there have been reviews and whatever where exactly what you have described uh, has happened. And my understanding is that's true of pretty much every health service, uh, health system in the world, and of course a lot of other institutions that are not uh, health systems. Um, what I don't think I have ever seen the evidence to say, which is not to say it's not true, but I've never seen any evidence, is that that is the overriding culture uh, of the health uh, system. Um, uh, so I don't think, unless 
uh, say no. I don't think um, uh, we have seen evidence that uh, that is the uh, uh, the dominant culture. And as I say, I've only been doing this three years, and that was well into um, a change of culture. Um, the um, uh, uh, the people I meet, both clinical and other staff, um, are dedicated to patient safety. Uh, they may, that doesn't mean they don't always get it right, um, and it doesn't always mean they have the skills to do it uh, properly, uh, but I never feel personally that I am meeting people who do not have patient welfare and patient uh, uh, safety at the, um, at the top of their agenda. Now that is slightly different, of course, from the issues you've been raising about do people listen to patient voice well. Um, but as I say, I don't tend to meet people where I'm not thinking they don't put the, um, uh, they are not seeking to put the patient first. It's why I think um, actually the, how, how do we train people as a system um, so that they do have the skills to do that well is one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, important, uh, uh, important features. Um, so, uh, so, I, so I can't strictly answer your question on um, uh, do we think that's the overriding culture because I don't think I have seen evidence uh, either way uh, but as I say I wouldn't deny that that has happened and happened historically um, and quite clearly things like uh, in particular uh, the duty of candour that we introduced um, after me I say we the pre and before my time I can't take any credit at all um, that was a clear indication that we wished the um, uh, uh, the culture of how clinicians related to patients to change um, backed by a legal duty so to the extent that clearly Parliament and others would not have thought that needed to be a change unless there was a problem it was clearly a problem in the system I continue to like to think on the basis of the people I've met that, that most um, excellent doctors and nurses and etc that was how they wanted to relate to patients anyway but it was clearly a, a thing on which we Can needed I just to take action because I yes. absolutely agree with everything you said, but probably pretty much everybody in the NHS is in it because they want to help yeah. patients and I was for many years chairman of the Standards Committee of the yes. Medical Council who was involved in the introduction of good medical practice yeah. which has at its centre the need for truth yes. and transparency in the treatment, in, in the relationship of doctors and patients. Yeah. So personally, I regret the need for the duty of candor because I thought we already had it. <laughs> but yeah. putting that to one side, what yeah. I, we've said to the very large number of people who have come to see us and institutions is that it's been at the back of now the forefront of our minds that we're looking at three things that have gone wrong. But there have been quite a lot of other things that have gone wrong over the last decades. And uh, William, you mentioned some others today, and, uh, and it's taken the patients to bring it to our attention. It's groups of patients, and we're then working with politicians that has made the system, and I have to say my, my profession, pay attention. And somehow that doesn't seem quite right to me, and I just wonder well, whether, don't quite finish the I'm point. Sorry. I just wonder whether it's because patients are simply one of the stakeholders in the National Health Service and we don't particularly recognise they're the reason for it and whether we need to find a different way of engaging the service with its purpose. Um, well, uh, my first answer is um, uh, 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 you, you, you have far more experience of uh, these issues over time than I do, uh, not than necessarily than Sally. Uh, so I think. No, he but, has more. Um, uh, so I think but there is a serious. Yes. No. Sorry. I was going to come on to. I was going to come on to my view. Yeah. Now, I don't have that. Yes. Now. Um, at, um, now, as I say, um, at, uh, an awful lot of the patient safety uh, initiatives uh, and policies over the last five or six years um, have been predicated on exactly the type of analysis that you have just given. Um, and um, uh, uh, so in terms of do we take these things uh, seriously uh, enough, um, I would say, uh, uh, recently, and I say this has nothing to do with me, it predates me by 
um, uh, 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 several years, um, uh, that thinking is coming much more to the forefront. Are we at the end of the process of having a system which we think works properly? No, we're not, um, and we have more to do. Uh, the one thing I would add, however, um, when I look at uh, quality uh, systems uh, in all sectors, um, and pretty much in all countries, um, uh, there is a uh, whistle-blowing and campaigning element to all of them. Um, it would obviously be perfect uh, if there never had to be a whistleblower and never had to be people who raise concerns in the way that um, you've been uh, describing. Um, but I'm not aware of a single quality system that does not have in it um, a, uh, a big role for how do we actually promote whistleblowing and uh, people raising concerns in that way and then having systems within uh, organisations and systems that uh, deal with them and we of course as you know I, I repeat um, done a lot on um, uh, uh, how we deal with whistleblowing still more uh, to do um, so that does have to be part of the system the question um, uh, that we uh, all need to address is uh, is there too much reliance on that for people who are not the system itself to be raising concerns and and as uh, 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 Simon's question was um, uh, pointing towards has the system been too reluctant to listen to it when it happened which was certainly the case in mid Staffordshire yeah. as uh, Robert Francis and others uh, found and it's clearly in the system we think we've made quite a lot of progress on those things but I wouldn't dispute with you that there is considerably uh, uh, considerably more to do and then can I just, take I just it back to the just sorry oh, to interrupt just, yeah. a, uh, just a, an observation yeah. on, on what you've just said I think we'd all agree that yeah. there is obviously an important role for whistleblowers, whether that's people yeah. inside the yeah. system or people outside the system. Yeah. What characterises the three things that we're looking at, different as they all are, yeah. is that people have had to yes. fight for yes. exactly. years and years, yeah. and in one case for yeah. decades and decades, yes. to get listened to. So yeah. it's not just someone raising a hand. No, absolutely. This is no, a, that, this that, is sorry, a, that, this it, is a chronic it, problem. Yeah, exactly. Well. If I did not make myself clear, that is exactly it. Um, and quite clearly the system over time has not done that as he's shown by things like Robert's report and but will So if I, uh, can I just add, add two points on the duty of candour, uh, one of my teams was responsible for the introduction of it led by me and obviously as, as Chris has said it's, it's meant to be a formal break point in discussion in order that people are open. As you say Cyril, it is a thing that would be expected anyway but it clearly wasn't happening. Yeah. Now when it was introduced which was the end of 2014 so nearly five years ago the expectation was that there would be um, you know, a flurry of claims and a flurry of activity around the actual duty itself. Now there have been some of those, but they've been less than expected. And I think that's partly because actually, we have a piece of research ongoing about it, so I can't give you the evidence yet, that actually the system has taken on board the point of the duty of candor, which is how, as organisations and systems, are we more open? Not do we tick the box every time we have a conversation with the patient, or do we try and minimise the number of times it comes into play? So I think the way the duty of candor has actually come through has been quite promising. My observation on that, because that came out of mid-staff, so when I was on the other side of the table and I was the secretary of the first mid-staff's inquiry 10 years ago, this is an observation, it was clear that there, are, there were elements within the arrangements there that when patients were saying a consistent message about something being wrong wasn't sufficiently acknowledged. Um, and as Sir Chris said, we don't have the evidence, but I don't think that is a carte blanche position, but in the instances where it is clearly people making a point and regularly, there needs to be a better responsiveness. Now the duty of candour was saying no, don't let it all build up and then have an inquiry on something else, actually try and do it at the base point. So coming back to your point about the interactions of the system, uh, I mean, there are proposals that I think Aidan was starting to talk about, about being able to look at the various alerts that you have across the system horizontally to see what the, what the problems are. But then there is the more fundamental thing, and probably the thing that does take longer inevitability, inevitably, which is how do you change the attitudes in the one-to-one in -one interactions where, where that is not ideal, Duty of candor is a contribution to that. So, in a sense, mm. the issues we're talking about are always going to operate at both the individual medical patient interaction yeah. and where things have got difficult at the 
I suppose the um, I suppose the evidence we do have um, is it does of course come up in CQC inspections. Mm -hmm. um, so we would be able uh, to tell, and, and, and certainly my understanding is you know, outstanding trusts yeah. tend to be the ones yeah. uh, that do these sorts of things uh, exceptionally well, and at the other end of the scale. Yeah. Not so. I suppose at uh, uh, individual institution yeah. level, we're going to. And then the other point I was going to make on your uh, point was, um, when I was at a, um, <coughs> uh, a medical school a few weeks ago, watching uh, future clinicians be trained with actors on how to deal with patients. Um, and as it was explained to me, that was not what was happening even ten years ago, and certainly not twenty, thirty years it ago. Happens within a few yards of where you are at the moment. Yes, okay. sitting right now, yeah. And that those changes in medical training to focus on you know, that you know, is the patient at the centre of it in the way that you describe. As I understand it, that is a very different way of training future clinicians than would have happened mm. for the clinicians who were dealing with the situation. Is that, is that fair? Oh, I think you were responsible, weren't you, from the GMC for pushing for this. Uh, I have to say, my younger daughter's just passed her finals, and she is much better prepared to be a good dog than I ever was. Um, the way that she has been trained to communicate with patients is around engagement and listening, and she could get 90%, 7% in her communication skill, she probably told me. But also her understanding of prescribing and the impacts of interventions. Because as I think about all these issues, I think we've got a number of different things at play. One is something about the culture of locally, whether it's of a hospital or a practice. Um, and we know that they can fail, or we know with good leadership, they can have a really good culture. To be open and transparent takes not only culture, which means attitude, but time, because to respect a patient and give them time, you can't be pushing them through. You have to actually spend time with them. Um, and it, it is also about understanding where they're coming from. And if they come from a different culture, I mean, I had a wonderful, and my subject is sickle cell disease, as Cyril knows, yeah. I had a wonderful set of nurses who would say, you didn't get that right because you didn't know this about our culture. And they'd haul the patient back in and I'd start again and have to say, I'm really sorry, my nurse says I didn't know that bit, so can we talk about this in a different way? But you need, we all need it, help in that. Um, I think that for doctors to be that open, respectful, and everything needs the managers to be on their side. I come from a hospital that was famous, Central Middlesex, for working effectively with managers. Guys, thanks to Cyril, was effective. Many are, but not all of them. And again, the ones where that works well are the successful hospitals. The ones where they don't work well are the ones we all worry about. So we're talking about pressure and the pressures that are put on managers that they may transmit, which then gets in the way. How do you know when to stop the clock and say, look, we need to mediate, whether it's starting again? I mean, I have been known to say to patients, I don't think this works. Why don't we transfer you to a different doctor? Because I'm not managing to work effectively. Only one ever did transfer, because if you're that honest, they think it's worth pursuing it, I found. But getting in someone else to help mediate or, or open it up, um, opioids is, uh, is one of the issues at the moment. And I had a, a sickle cell disease. Um, there's a big issue about opioid use. So, and thanks, everything. Honey. I mean, we don't disagree with anything you're saying. I absolutely take that on board. But <clears throat> before you arrived, um, we did say that to begin with, we wanted to talk about general questions. And we more or less covered the areas that we wanted to discuss uh, with colleagues across the table. Um, but we now really want to go into specific areas. And we're looking much, much broadly now. And we're looking at hormone pregnancy tests. And this is one of the three areas that we've been asked to uh, consider by <coughs> the previous Secretary of State. And you were talking about time, and I absolutely appreciate that 
time is of the essence, whether it's with the individual or whether it is on a much broader scale. But if we look at hormone pregnancy tests, and perhaps we've been concentrating quite a lot on prima dos as one of them, um, it's interesting that the families have lived with the uncertainty and the guilt and the hardship for at least 40 years over the use of these tests. Now, we've heard a lot from the families, both with a hormone pregnancy test with primados and also with sodium valparate, that they feel really guilty that they took this medication and this has been children which they are now having to um, look after. So really, we are very concerned that it has taken so long, 40 years, for these things to come to light and for action to be taken. And so we really would like to explore with you the science and the regulatory decision making which takes place or doesn't take place. Because obviously, one of the most important things within this review is to try and stop these things happening again. So how, what are the mechanisms? How can we ensure that things are seen at a much earlier stage, that action is taken? And we've been talking before you came in, Sally, about the structures within the NHS and how they are very vertical and there's hardly any horizontal links. Now, clearly, if we're going to make real progress in these three areas, um, with sodium vibrate and with mesh, we, we've got to think differently. We've got to see what we can do in order to anticipate some of the things that could happen and also the things that are in very early stages that are causing so much grief and suffering. So we'd love your ideas. So I'd like to make two general points. First, as an apology, not only an apology that I couldn't get here earlier, but actually, clearly, I, I find these stories very distressing. It is terrifically sad that these women and their families have suffered and that it has taken so long. So I too abhor this. Um, but the other general thing I was going to say is I don't think we have explained to the public, and I don't think doctors are very good at it, that effective medicines and interventions usually have a side effect profile. And even now, it's very difficult to do an effective consent. I, I think a consent was failed in most of these women. So I'm talking at a general level. Um, and I actually agree with who believes that you never truly have informed consent because you can never know everything. Um, and having been a patient, as most of us have at some points, I think she has a point. But we are not good at explaining that effective medicines usually have a side effect profile, discussing that risk balance so the patient takes it, a, an informed choice, and discussing the difference between the possible side effects of the intervention and the doing of the intervention. So, you know, it's one thing discussing side effects of statins. Um, they very rarely kill. They're having started with the Stevens Johnson syndrome. Clearly, they can, uh, they border on that. But when you're talking about um, an implanted device, it's not only the safety of that particular device, it's also the practice of the person. So um, I'll go back to sickle cell because I think these are germane to these discussions. Um, when we started with prenatal diagnosis, it was first done by amniotic fluid, then we moved to chorionic villus biopsy. The miscarriage rate was 20% until the obstetricians learned and got it down to 2%. If you were in that learning curve, that was awful. But at least what we did as haematologists would say, you know, you can have an early one, but here's the risk profile, or you can have a bit later and it's much safer. And as the risk profile came down, we changed it. But I think we have to be much more upfront about all of that. So you're talking about primados in particular. And of course, this is there are two big issues here. One, that it's historical. So it antedates thalidomide, and we brought in a whole new regulation system post-thalidomide. 
Um, I think um, it's helpful to look at what we do now, but looking back at that, you then have this disputed area about the science of um, if you did not miscarry and you went to term, did it cause fetal malformations? And having had a look at the literature, there's clearly an association. But is there a causation? The zebrafish work shows an association, but it was reversible when uh, the author was quizzed. The chicken data is not a hard data. And I looked last night at Carl Hennigan's um, work, and even he said it's important to recognize that observational studies can demonstrate associations of harm. We've got an association. Concern about observational studies in assessing harm is due to the introduction of bias from the uncontrolled confounding. And even after careful matching and adjustment for known risk factors, residual confounding may persist. So the group of experts who've been looking at this data and looked at his paper say, yes, there's an association, but actually um, there's no evidence of causation. So what that suggests to me, and we would have expected if we had them um, prescribing to one million women, that with 1.9% of births anyway having the malformation, 19,000 women would have had a child with a birth defect anyway. So what that suggests to me is that we haven't managed to have the transparent conversation at a point where they could have heard that and made them feel heard. And as doctors, we've all been party to discussions with patients where you think, if only my colleague had done this at the beginning, this poor patient and family would not have had all that distress. So I think there are two things. One is about the data and did Primidos harm, and the, there's an association, but we haven't found Yes, I, I think we're really well aware of that. And the other is, <clears throat> how was it handled and communication? And then the third is, how do we regulate now? And is it satisfactory now? What is your view of that? I think it's a pretty safe system. Um, I um, feel that we need to always do more to make sure we are communicating better with patients. Um, perpetually surprised that since we've been putting in packet inserts since 99, patients don't generally read them. Um, I always do, but clearly I would. Um, so how do we make it that patients are better informed? And I think that is about training, and we know we have a number of consultants who are not trainable any longer. So, so when we look at the historic evidence, and um, We've looked what the MHRI said in 2014, and then the second, the expert working group. Now, both those reports have been severely criticised by the patient group. And there is a feeling that they were conducted by or in collaboration with interested parties. So why do you think that those affected parties should have confidence in such investigations? Well, I, I meet with the chief exec and the chair of um, MHRA on pr generally about every six months, and I uh, do discuss some of these issues. I have to say, I saw no reason not to have confidence in those reports. I mean, if the patients have a problem, then we must explore it. Well, but it they seemed they to me that, that they very clearly, very, very clearly to the expert working group, to the MHRA. Well, when I looked at CMO, the panel looked to have the appropriate skills and backgrounds to make the judgments they did. And I don't think it's for a CMO to um, second guess their, out their outcome and their reports. But you're ultimately responsible. No, I'm an independent advisor. They are responsible. And I think but they, they are do then, a good job. But the MHRA are then accountable to the permanent secretary. Yeah, and, uh, and the way we met it, I'll, I'll make a reflection on um, uh, Sally's points in a moment. I mean, the way, uh, the way we do it, um, uh, it is an executive agency of the department to which we delegate um, the, uh, the, the technical uh, responsibilities. Uh, the department does not um, uh, to second guess 
um, the, uh, the technical work of our agencies, that's why they exist to be technically expert. Uh, we take a view on the overall effectiveness and accountability uh, of those uh, uh, agencies, uh, but we do not uh, and are not uh, either uh, staffed or competent uh, to uh, uh, look at individual products um, and decisions beyond what the CMO and her uh, deputies do, who of course are medically uh, uh, qualified. Um, if I reflect on, and I say this is a reflection on what uh, Sally uh, has said, it goes to your uh, question, um, we see a, uh, a lot of evidence. Um, uh, starting with the respect that the, uh, uh, the rest of the world has for our system um, in, the, uh, uh, in the technical uh, competence of our uh, regulatory system. It's re regularly held up in other countries as being the kind of thing you aspire to and of course the MHRA does an awful lot of work or has done for the European Medicines Agency because it is seen as a, uh, a leader in the uh, uh, field. I mean the question that uh, the Chief Medical Officer is raising and indeed your questions raise, which we think is a, uh, a fair question, is is that technical competence matched by uh, the, um, uh, the ability to communicate uh, and build the trust of patients uh, to the same level as the technical competence, which is almost um, the institutional version of what we were describing or what we were talking about before of the relationship between an individual patient and a doctor the doctor may be astonishingly technically competent but uh falls down on that conversation that can of course happen with the institutional level that is one of the questions that i'm sure the panel will want to uh, um, advise us on um, so we certainly uh have confidence from everything we have seen and we're doing in uh, do the MHRA and indeed a lot of the other bodies that you have mentioned do the science and the technicals of this well? The question that the issues and your, uh, your questions raise and indeed the whole existence of this raises is has that technical expertise translated into a conversation, uh, the correct conversation with patients that has built trust, reacted quickly uh, done all the things you describe as uh, as, as, as should have happened. Um, so, uh, and this is simply my opinion. Um, at, uh, you know, uh, as I say, with no medical background and three years' experience of this, that um, uh, that is probably uh, that's probably the area that, as a system, we need to uh, uh, improve on. Is that is, is that fair? Yes, Sally? I think that's well put. Can I, can I just go back to what was happening at the time when Primados was still on the market? So in 1967, there was published um, prima facie evidence of a, an association, and it was an association as opposed to direct causation. Um, nothing seems to have happened when, in terms of regulatory decision making at that point. In 1970, the McGregor Committee advised that the product should no longer be used for pregnancy testing, and yet, the product continued to be used, and as far as we can tell, it continued to be used for pregnancy testing. And at no point during that period, right up until 75, did women have the, the risks or the potential risks explained to them. And whilst it was a different era, I think we all accept that, would you now, looking back, say that things could and should have been done differently? Well, I look back at that period. I graduated in 72. We had a very different system. I'm on record on television talking about being brutalised by it, by how my consultant colleagues behaved to patients, which was in a paternalistic way, um, and how I, as a woman, felt. We don't have a system like that. I mean, it can be pretty brutal when you're young and you're faced with people who are sick and dying, but it is very different. I thought it was wrong then. I still think it's wrong, but we have moved on. Um, and it was history, hierarchical systems, and um, serious rationing. But do you think so women? Do you think women should have been given more information about? Well, risks? of course I do. I think women should be. Given but back then, I mean, sorry, not now. I mean, we, we well, there that. were many things I thought patients should be given much more information about. So I joined this with it. 
Sally, can I just go, go into the details of it? Because it's really important for thinking about the future. Um, the, we, we now know, because we've been researching it, that there are records of concern by both the manufacturer and the system. It was the Committee of Safety of Drugs at the time. It's, that's all changed. Uh, about the potential risk of Primadoss in causing congenital abnormalities. And, uh, and certainly, from my view, that by 1970, there was enough information there in this mod world for, on the precautionary principle, which maybe didn't apply in those days, for patients to actually, women to be warned of the concern, even though it wasn't removed from the market. It was removed from the market in 1978, and we don't actually know why. Um, it was, uh, but, but those eight years, a lot of women took the medicine and a number of them, uh, whether it was causal or not, had uh, damaged babies. Now, I think what I, we would wish to, to think about is whether, given the, cons the concerns which were expressed uh, within the system at that time, Nowadays, the present regulatory system will either at least warn people about the risk directly or maybe uh, remove it from the market. We can't say, but I just want, are you confident now that the system wouldn't have allowed those eight years to happen without the women at least being warned about the anxiety that was felt within the regulatory authorities? Well, yes, I have faith in the MHRA. I do think we've changed. And the Committee of Human... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's about I'll, I'll repeat my own view. Yes, I know. I completely agree. Yeah. 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 Um, I agree. And I, I mean, I think, I mean, if you look at, I mean, you will probably know this, but if you look at the chronology of the 1970s, there were some first indications in 1970 sharing removed the indication of diagnosis yeah. of pregnancy from the data sheet following a recommendation from the McGregor Committee. There was a Committee of Safety on Medicines uh, review which reported in 1975 advised prescribers not to use hormone tests for diagnosing pregnancy because of hazards, published various letters in the BMJ, other places, sent letters to GPs, family planning doctors, uh, put it in the professional journals. Now, of course, uh, that, that was in an era where it wasn't the norm at that time to have the open conversations about risks that are now much more prevalent. Uh, it was only in 1999 that the patient leaflets had to be uh, published uh, for all cases and uh, it was eventually removed in 1978 by sharing reportedly for commercial reasons because in a sense medicine and the way you did pregnancy testing had moved on. So I mean th there was some progress made in the 1970s to uh, start to look at the risks the way those things were communicated, going back to the earlier discussion, but it's relevant, was through, in a sense, professional routes. It didn't particularly get out to the patient route. That would be a different situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I'd add to my colleagues, I agree with Dolly, and um, uh, I'm merely repeating what I've said in public uh, lots of times, the Public Accounts Committee, and as there is, I never use the word confident. Uh, I might think the word confident is a, uh, a difficult and potentially complacent uh, uh, word. Um, and, uh, and our attitude needs to be ever vigilant. Uh, I say this about all issues in health and uh, uh, social care, and I'm, of course, uh, challenged to say I'm confident in X or Y all the time. Uh, to, and that is always uh, my uh, answer. But with that proviso that I always give, I agree entirely with my uh, two colleagues. Mm. I mean, uh, and certainly in his statement, um, the previous Secretary of State, when he was launching the review uh, in Parliament, was saying that uh, we didn't have to go into the science again, and that the science was ambivalent in terms of causation as opposed to um, an association. But so the MHRA, as I said earlier, in 2014, and also the second um, expert working group in 2017. Uh, we're looking at the evidence again and trying to make the assessments. Now, I, we were hoping that we would get some real clarification on this, and um, it's good that the expert working groups were set up, etc. But 
we still have a problem in that even what the expert working groups have come out with have been so criticised by the patient group. So if you're trying to build confidence, how do you do that if these very important groups who are trying to decide on the science, how do you actually ensure that the patient groups have some confidence in what they have come out with? Because at the moment, they certainly do not have. And I'm not sure where we go from here, because we were looking to some resolution on both the MHRI and the expert working group. Um, well, I think in terms of, um, um, well, um, uh, I mean, as you say, we're not here to particularly replay the science and it's not the right set of people to do so. But what we're really talking about is that, uh, is the, the thing about how science meets public mm. communication. And as you say, in many of the areas, and we deal with this uh, the entire time, the, the science only has value uh, if, uh, uh, if it has uh, public trust. I mean, we have to have people who trust. Uh, the advice we give uh, based on the uh, 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 based on the science. So it, uh, what you're describing is one facet of a general uh, problem. Um, and in terms of where we go, um, we just have to keep going and do better. Uh, right. To be honest, I don't. I, if there was a magic bullet to one point how we to the MHA, uh, MHA yeah. when they came to see us, yeah, uh, both Sarah and I, yeah. members of the National Academy of Medicine in Washington. Yeah. And, and when they do reports, they they put in place a peer review group to review the report yeah. independently yeah. before it's released. And we suggest the MHRA that would have been a better way to yeah. deal with this. Yeah, and I think that's. Well, I don't know whether I think yeah. that's worth looking at. The other one I think I was going to suggest that you looked at was what we've done with NIHR because we are the world beacon for patient and public involvement. So we have a program called Involve. We train patients and the public in how to sit on committees. We ch train chairs how to involve them and listen and bring them in. They are part of every decision we take through NIHR. And I just wondered whether it would be worth thinking about whether our scientific committees on the a MHRA should learn from that experience. Yes, I mean, certainly from my experience, which I say largely not in uh, medicine uh, on these things. Um, it is never one thing, um, uh, to, and it goes back to some of the questions that the panel was asking earlier. It is about having that whole culture of we have to do better each time. So it will be exactly what you've described, and then exactly what you've described, and then it will be 15 other things, and it will be every year uh, challenging ourselves on the question of how are we making the science accessible, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera recognising um, that as we see nothing to do with the three areas you're looking at but we see this across uh, uh, at the moment uh, uh, science and public opinion and the world is that they won't always agree um, and that the science will not always say what people want um, and give them the answers but or as you say in some of these areas uh, the science simply won't be able to answer the question when what the public wants is a clear answer so we have to recognise there will be those tensions but be sort of ever restless on the what do they do in other countries that where, where they do this better and what can we steal and borrow and go further uh, 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 and further so I don't think and uh, I don't think there is a single answer to your question but nor am I pessimistic that it can improve every year um, and but we have these problems is an incentive to uh, try harder in uh, my view and where I have seen these things work it has been that culture of you are never in a position where um, we now listen to patient voice as well as we conceivably can that's not an achievable state it has to be the culture that you've been describing of you know, let us continually challenge and look for the you know, the next thing that will help build that public trust and that confidence it's partly about the communication skills of people from science um, and, um, and, and it's partly about, as you say, the systems that we use that bring people in, as I say, but recognising that not everyone will always uh, uh, agree. Maybe one thing that would help. Yeah. Would, 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 I was, I was, going, to, I was going to say that one of the planks of the Primados working group was about communicating to patients mm. and the public with a number of actions for the MHRA specifically. 
and obviously although the working group was looking at Primados, it was looking at the forward issues of about, about how do you communicate risk, which I mean is true to Primados mm -hmm. and other things. So although it was historic, Primados was not being given in 1978, it was trying to say, okay, so how, do, how don't we replicate those things that may have gone wrong in yes. this particular instance in more general yes. circumstances? And the, um, Sorry, and of course, oh, sorry, sorry. Well, I, was, yeah. Yeah, I was kind of going to touch on a similar point that and it touches on what Sir Chris has said as well. That if if you take the the EWGs in relation to Primados as, as the relevant point here, that in order to give the patient group confidence in the process, it's not just in the science; it's in the process yes. that leads to the science. Yes. And I think their concern is at least in part, if not mainly, about process as much as it is about. Science. Yeah. So so. Involving the patient group more closely in how to do this, yep. not necessarily in the doing of it, because they're not equipped perhaps to do it, but in the how are we going to do this in such a way as to give everyone involved, including you as the patients, yep. people who've suffered, confidence would have perhaps led to less mm -hmm. criticism when the EWGs produced yep. the work. No, would, that, would that make sense? Uh, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. and. Um, um, uh, in particular, um, uh, greater transparency is always part of the answer. Um, but, uh, I was going to say nothing to do with these three cases, but um, uh, that thing across public policy uh, where you treat the public as grown up adults unable to understand difficult messages um, and have the conversation bluntly and transparently almost always what makes the world. Uh, better and you know so the um, I mean the culture that Sally was describing from the 1970s uh, was the sort of much more extreme end of you know, we're the experts we know best your your job as the patient is to believe the grand expert um, and that culture needs to go completely of course you want your experts and of course you want people who are highly trained know know the answer but acting in a way of um, again it goes back to the sort of duty of can do is a um, our job is to be transparent about our expertise and have a grown-up conversation with people. As I say, recognising that you may not agree, mm. um, and actually, not agreeing is an okay uh, uh, thing as long as the conversation has been uh, done uh, uh, done properly and uh, uh, and transparently. Uh, so I wouldn't disagree with anything you've uh, uh, said. No, we're always learning, aren't we? Yes, now, as I say, bat battle never won on this. It's a very important phrase to me on uh, all this. Um, one of the things that we thought we might have a break now, I don't know if you would welcome that.